Today, it's my privilege to introduce you to not only Florida's great governor, but no doubt one of the greatest governors in this country that has been championing our industry. First, I want to share with you a few facts about our governor that you probably don't know. He was born in Jacksonville, Florida. He played baseball growing up, and he even played in the Little League World Series. After graduating from high school, he attended Yale University, where he was captain of the Yale baseball team, the varsity baseball team. After graduating from Yale, magna cum laude, he attended Harvard Law School, where he also graduated with honors. While he attended Harvard, he also served our country in the United States Navy, where he earned commission as a US Navy JAG officer. While serving in the Navy, he worked as a lawyer in Guantanamo Bay. His military decorations include the Bronze Star Medal, a Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal, the Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, and the Iraq Campaign Medal. Following his time in active duty service, Governor DeSantis served as a federal prosecutor. He was elected to Congress as a U.S. Representative for Florida's 6th District. In 2019, he was elected as the 46th governor of the state of Florida. His support of our industry during the worst year in history by keeping businesses open, keeping our employees working, and keeping our schools open. He continued to have our backs as he continues to do today. He would call on a regular basis and check with me about our industry, and I can tell you, his passion for this industry is endless. He would make regular calls and the first thing he would say is, Carol, how are your members doing and what can I do to help? And all that time, as I've shared with the governor numerous times, my colleagues would call many of you and say, I just want your governor, your state's open. He has a beautiful wife, Casey, and three children, Madison, Mamie, and Mason. Governor, I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be here and also for just constantly having our back and not shutting our industry down and allowing us to have the freedom that you have given us in this state. Please welcome to the stage Governor Ron DeSantis. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, let me just welcome you to America's freest state. I hope you're enjoying yourselves. We're proud of uh, what we're doing in Florida for the last year and a half. We've worked very hard to stand up to entrench bureaucrats and corporate media to keep the state open and to make sure people have a right to work and businesses have a right to operate and our kids have a right to be kids and go to school in person. And uh, the result has been uh, the state's thriving uh, we were not, when COVID hit, there was a lot of uncertainty, but I mean, I think it was pretty clear early on, if you actually followed the data that you needed to have things open, you can't just, you know, hibernate in a cave and hope it goes away. It's just not the way it works. And so I resolved early on, we were not going to let Florida descend into some Faucian dystopia in which free people's freedoms were curtailed and their livelihoods were destroyed. And so we chose freedom over Fauciism. Uh, and the result is people have not only come here to visit, to be able to live normal, they've moved here, people have moved their businesses here, and, um, and the state's better for it. There was uh, one of the photos of me when one of the press conferences we did, that was at a steakhouse in West Palm Beach. It was, I think it was probably the end of the summer in 2020, and um, Fauci is just railing on restaurants. It's like he just wants restaurants closed, and, um, you know, in Florida, we had had uh, restaurants open, but in the summer of 2020, at the end, you know, we said there should not even be any capacity limits. You do what you want to do. Let people make decisions. If someone doesn't want to be in a restaurant, then they can go somewhere else. That's fine. No one's saying you have to go, but people's livelihoods are at stake here. And so he was saying close restaurants. Uh, criticizing Florida for having them open, saying that this would be some major disaster. You had New York and these places that were doing, you know, all these, uh, you know, really weird things. So we did this press conference there. And, yeah, I had the owner of the place who talked about it. 
But I had the butcher from the steakhouse talk about, it's the only job he's had for 24 years since coming to the U.S. from Haiti. I talked about, we had the bartender talk about, you know, having three kids to support on a single income, the servers, all the people that make all this work and how not allowing restaurants to be open or even not allowing people to go in, what that would do. Um, and people were really, uh, I think it resonated with a lot of people because no one was standing up for these people except for me. Like I'm the whole country, it was like the media was attacking people like me for standing up so that these folks would be able to earn a living and have a livelihood. And I think like, is this based on any type of science? I don't think so. I look at some of these cities in the north and they say, Fauci, you can't eat indoors, it's so dangerous. So they have everyone outside, which is fine. I mean, when you're outside, you know, you definitely have less risk. I think that's fine. But what happens is it gets cold in these places, right? And so you can't just be outside the whole time, but you're not supposed to do indoor dining. So what they would do is they would build structures on the street and on the sidewalk and so they wouldn't allow them to eat inside the restaurant, but they'd be in this structure that had worse ventilation where you're probably in closer contact just because it was theoretically outside. And I'm just thinking to myself, how the hell did it end up getting to this where we're doing things that are just so absolutely insane and stupid? You're much worse off to be in one of those little igloos that are outside on the street in Chicago or New York than you are actually sitting inside of a restaurant. And so... Uh, we had to battle a lot of nonsense throughout the whole time. But I'll tell you, you know, people like Fauci, you know, are very destructive in terms of, because they don't care about people's jobs or businesses at all. Um, they have a different agenda, so they don't care. And I don't know why the hell he still has a job. He should have been fired a long time ago. But I don't understand. And so, so you understand that. But People, if you look at probably one of the biggest culprits that's led to a lot of destruction of jobs and, um, and businesses in a lot of these other states, it's really the corporate media, you know, for whipping up hysteria, constantly lying about everything, never providing any proper context, trying to play on people's fears. And just think about what they got wrong through this. They said lockdowns would, st you needed lockdown to stop COVID. The lockdowns didn't stop COVID. And they attack people, you know, states like Florida where we're open and have done much better. They said that if you forced everyone to wear masks, the pandemic would end in 2020. They said that. That didn't work. You had places that had 98% mass usage, like Los Angeles had massive outbreak last winter. They said you couldn't have schools open because that would cause uh, huge problems. And yet we've had schools open all of last year, all of this year. And, and oh, by the way, they will never tell you this in other states, the corporate press. We have the lowest COVID in the country in this state for four weeks in a row. Um, and that's just the reality. And we have no mandates, no restrictions, no anything. You have these other places that have vaccine passports and mandates and all this stuff, and they're surging and all this. So this is all theater. None of it works. But the media said you couldn't have schools. We did that, and you saw you did. Then they said... You know, if 50%, Fauci would say, if 50% are vaccinated, you will never see any more surges of COVID. And that's absolutely false. You see huge surges in Europe. You're going to start to, you're seeing it in the north now. It's going to continue, unfortunately, for probably another six to eight weeks. And you have very many places having their worst outbreaks ever, even though, um, you know, they've only had vaccines for the past nine months. And so, so they've been wrong on just about everything. They never admit they're wrong. They just kind of move on and pretend that it doesn't that it doesn't happen. They never mention Florida anymore. It's like it doesn't even exist. It's like it fell off the continental United States because it doesn't fit their narrative. And so they've been they've been wrong time and time again. But they their irresponsibility has hurt people in this country. I mean, just think about. If you look when the, they really started ratcheting up the hysteria in March of 2020, you saw a huge decline in people showing up to emergency departments to get care for heart and stroke. And the question is, is why would that happen? Did all of a sudden people stop having heart attacks and having strokes? No, I don't think anyone believes that. What happened was they scared people. So you actually have people that need cardiac attention or having strokes. They're sitting at home. They're scared to go into the hospital. Because the media is saying you're going to get COVID and die, or actually they were saying the hospitals have no room because they're overflowing with COVID patients. I can tell you in Florida, the whole pandemic, 
the most we ever had, we have 65,000 licensed beds, the most COVID positive patients, and that's not even people being treated of COVID because everyone gets swabbed that if you're positive and in for something, they still count you as that. But out of 65,000 beds, our peak for the whole pandemic was 17,000 COVID positive patients in hospital. The media made it sound like if you needed anything other than COVID, there was no room for you, no bed. So there were people who did not go get medical attention uh, who needed it. There's people that didn't get cancer screening, whole bunch of other things uh, because of the fear that was whipped up uh, by, by the press. There's kids that got locked out of school for an entire year plus in different parts of our country because the corporate press kept telling parents that the kids were at uh, special danger of this, that kids were going to spread it to everybody, all this stuff. All of those things are demonstrably false um, and, and easily proven false by evidence, but that, that's what they did. When we had, over the summer, when we had increases in, in hospital admissions, we looked and said, okay, you know, I mean, we had like 95% of seniors vaccinated, but it's like, okay, people are still getting infected. What's, and we found out no one was getting early treatment. They had a treatment approved since December with the monoclonal antibodies. Fauci doesn't talk about it. These people don't talk about it because they don't want people to know there's early treatment because they fear someone that knows there's early treatment may say, well, okay, I won't get the vaccine. If I get COVID, I'll just get treated for it. And they don't want that. They want to basically control your behavior. So they don't talk about it. And I said, we need to start using it. Nobody's getting treatment and they're ending up in the hospital. So we rolled out 25 sites uh, over about a seven day period. It was very quick that we did. And we treated over 150,000 people, and our hospital admissions went down 96%. Uh, we now have the tied for the lowest hospital census in the entire country with Hawaii. Um, we kept tens of thousands of people out of the hospital and saved probably thousands of lives, but when we rolled the monoclonals out, the corporate press attacked me for doing it. They said, oh, well, you're, you're doing that. You should be saying they should do vaccine. And whatever you think of the vaccine, certainly I don't think it should be mandated, but in the middle of a wave, it takes six weeks for that to even kick in. So if people are in the midst of a wave getting infected, they need treatment. The, the vaccine can't treat it after the fact. So you needed to have both and you needed to have this. And they attacked and they made it sound like this was something that was just totally, totally crazy. And yet it works and we've been able to save a lot of people. And I think probably from January, uh, uh, until this, until now, U.S. Uh, nationwide, I think we probably would have saved about 100,000 lives if this had been something that was just a matter of course. But you have most doctors in this country didn't even know about these. Most doctors in Florida didn't even know about them. They had been up, they had been an EUA for eight months. They didn't even know. They were, I, I, when I started doing press conferences, patients would ask their doctors, hey, can, what about these monoclonal? What about Regeneron? Like, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. How could you not know what that is? And so it's a huge failure. But the media, I think if they scared even a handful of people away from doing this, you know, that's all, all on them. And so, so they've been a very destructive force uh, throughout this whole time period. And I just think it's important to point out the people whose jobs we saved in Florida, the media wanted those people to lose their jobs. Okay, the people, the businesses that we saved in Florida, the media, they had their way. Uh, those are people that would have lost their jobs uh, or lost their businesses in the state of Florida. The kids that have been educated, clearly they did not want the kids going back to school in the state of Florida. And so uh, we've been able to, to succeed because we've actually followed the data, we actually respected people's freedoms, expected the, respected the Constitution, uh, but we are also willing you know, to stand up against these people in the media who have an agenda and who are not interested in providing the facts on any of this stuff. And I think that more than anything is why Florida stood out because I think you have some of these other governors, they just don't wanna be criticized. They don't wanna get hit um, or anything. And I think like with the public now, the public knows these people lie. So if you stand up to them, they actually like you more. It's smart to do it, to stand up to them. I don't know that everyone quite understands that because you know, when we were open, I mean, we were getting a lot of incoming. Um, part of it is they didn't want a control group because they knew that they had advocated these draconian policies. And if someone did it a different way and had uh, you know, the same or better results, then that would be something that they would be, have a hard time to explain. So standing up to that was really, really important. So now we're in a situation where you now have this hysteria over these forced vaccinations. 
And everyone said, even six months ago, you don't mandate. I mean, when, that's what we said from the beginning. We said we'd work hard to make it available for everyone who wants it, starting with senior citizens and working our way down the age room, but we will mandate it on none. And the first places we went were nursing homes and things like that. And, you know, I showed up at some of these nursing homes. We did, uh, we did strike teams. We, we did a bunch of stuff. But there were some nursing home residents that just didn't want it. And so what are you going to do? Are you going to force some 85-year-old, pin them to the ground, and force a shot into their arm if they don't want it? Um, and so I think it's something that people should be able to make a decision about. But at that time, we were told that if you do the shots, it's a 95% reduction in infection. Well, we know that's not even close to being true. I mean, it's waned as time has gone on. You have massive numbers of people who are vaccinated and still get infected. Now, hopefully, the vaccine reduces the severity. I think it has in many respects, although I think that's waned as well. They said it was 100% effective at hospitalization and death. I can tell you that's not true because most of our treatments we're giving to people with monoclonals are vaccinated people who've been infected in Florida. Um, but nevertheless, it's not something that stops infection. I think we know that. So the question is, from a scientific perspective, what right does the government have to come in and force somebody to do this or else lose their job? Force a business to mandate this or else have faced draconian fines? And in the legislation they're discussing, uh, and I don't know if any of this is going to pass in D.C., I mean, they're talking about mammoth fines for people who basically defied the regime on this, and it would cripple any, any family-owned business. Um, but if it's not stopping infection and transmission, then what is the possible basis to say it should be mandated? It's basically about how it affects you, uh, because you can be uh, vaccinated and still get infected, and yes, you can still spread it. So I think the, the, how we've gone from People saying six months ago, no, 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 shouldn't be mandated. Let's make it available for people. To now, all of a sudden, trying to eliminate people who haven't done the shots from society. There's some places you've got to show proof to be able to go to a restaurant, be able to go to a ball game, or all this other stuff. And and I think that's totally, totally misguided. I think the business mandate that they're trying to do through OSHA is going to have, I, first of all, it's not constitutional. I think it it is stayed now nationwide, and I think that likely will be the ultimate outcome. I don't know how you get there. Maybe, it, actually, they're doing a lottery today to figure out which court the cases gets consolidated in. And the bottom line is, I mean, I know, like, I know what the law says, and I know what the result will be, but I know if I get certain judges, I have no chance. And I know if I have other judges, I will win. And so if it gets in one of those circuits, where you have a lot of the judges that are going to uphold the government no matter what they do in administrative, we're done and you got to go to the Supreme Court. If it goes to one of the circuits where you're going to have judges actually recognize that this is an overreach, then we're fine and we'll be able to do it. Uh, but be that as it may, it's wrong to do this. We have uh, hundreds of thousands of job openings in the state of Florida. You know, most of the people who are working as nurses, hospitality, logistics, law for all these different areas, most of those folks are relatively low risk. Most of them are probably 20, 30s, 40s. Some of them have, I'd say probably most of them have already had COVID. And so th these are decisions that they've made. And so the question is, when you oppose this mandate, what's the attrition going to be? And if it's only 1% and if all, a lot of these key places, you know, you're going to see parts of the economy start to collapse. I mean, you, you don't like this, uh, what's happening with the supply chain now, some of the inflation. Just wait what will happen if this ends up going into effect. The same thing, I think, with these, this whole idea of a vaccine passport that you have to show this to be able to go. We started to see that last spring about this was percolating and they're saying they're going to do it in all these places. And oh, by the way, they have done it in a lot of places in Europe. And just look at the COVID spikes that are happening there. It doesn't stop these waves at all. Uh, that we've already, we can see that for sure. I mean, I knew that at the time, but clearly we see in real time now it doesn't stop it. And so we saw that people were thinking about doing it. And so my concern in Florida was really uh, twofold. I mean, I mean, one, I just, I don't think customers should be discriminated against. Two, yes, Florida, of course, was never going to mandate vaccine passports, but I could have had local governments try to do it. And I probably have a few that probably would have tried to do it. Then I also have corporations who, you know, if you're, if you're headquartered here, you have a little bit different view. If you're headquartered in some of these 
deep blue enclaves, it's a little bit different worldview. And quite frankly, it's not a worldview that I think makes a lot of sense in Florida and a lot of these issues. So I was concerned that if you had some of these places start to do this, then people are going to think, oh, Florida makes you, makes you show your, your papers. And I was like, no, 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 that is a total deal breaker. And quite frankly, we would not have had as good a summer season for tourism as we did if that had been something that had gotten out of the bag. So we just said no, no passports, period. Um, people can eat, people can go play, do whatever they want. Um, but this is not going to be something where we're going to pick and choose uh, amongst people. And if you look at 2021 in August, and compare Florida to 2021 to 2019 August pre-COVID, uh, we were up 12% in hotel uh, uh, revenue. We were up in f domestic flights coming into a lot of our our airports. Some of them are up huge. Um, the fact is, our reservations increased 20% in August compared to even July, and in other parts of the country they were declining for, for restaurants. And so I think had we allowed it to get down to where we were more like San Francisco, I don't think you would have seen that type of performance at all. I mean, I think people, when they want to come to Florida, they just want to know, they want to be able to get off the plane, and this is 2019, just like it would be. I mean, like there's no, no one's going to tell you you have to do. People do what they want. I mean, there are people that will wear masks. That's fine. I don't, you, you do what makes you comfortable, but there are no mandates, no restrictions, no any of that. And so we were able to, to thrive. Some parts of Florida have never done better uh, than they've done uh, so far this year. I mean, I think that we have certain you know, conventions and stuff. That's not anything about Florida. We've done well relative to other places on that. It's just not uh, kicking at full steam uh, right now, but that'll slowly kind of come back to life. And I think you're seeing more and more people. But at the end of the day, you have the ability to do, to do, uh, to do, these, to do the shots, to do the treatment. There's all these tools out there. So we have to be at a place where people can make those decisions and society moves forward, and we're not going to be imposing any type of, of mandates or restrictions. I don't know what's going to happen in these northern states, and in, in California too, I think we'll see. Uh, any state, all the states that had big waves last winter are going to have a wave this winter. I mean, that's just, you're already seeing it start. Um, yesterday, I think Florida reported like 1,000 new cases. Um, you know, New York reported like 8,000 new cases. And, you know, we have 3 million more people than they do. So you're seeing just the difference in terms of the region. It's a regional thing. And we may yet go up. I don't know that we've bottomed out yet, but we may. Um, and we may start going up, but I don't think we're going to be where they are in the north. And you're seeing Minnesota, Michigan, big, big increases. And so the question is, is if one of them starts to do these restrictions, or if the CDC comes and starts advocating for this, because the CDC in this country is not a scientific organization anymore. It's a politicized bureaucracy. They do not accept data and facts that conflict with their narrative. And I think the fear is, I mean, honestly, from Florida's perspective, it would probably benefit us, but I want to see our country do well. The fear is if you have a state start to do business restrictions or some mandates or CDC starts to say whatever they want to say about something. I mean, you know, we have most places in Florida just ignore the CDC. Uh, there's some that still, you know, we have major operations in Florida that require three-year-old kids to wear masks inside. Um, I don't know why, especially in Florida, we're the lowest, um, you know, in the country, but you still have that. So even though the, what the CDC does isn't necessarily obligatory on a state or on private, I think you will see, if they do something, I think you will see. You're now seeing Fauci say, well, you know, we, 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 the, the vaccines wane and, and we are seeing infections and, you know, and so they're going to advocate maybe more boosters or things like that. But I do think that there's a real possibility that they repeat some of the mistakes uh, that we saw uh, last year. And that obviously would be, would be very, very bad. One thing I think that I'd like to see, so just my observation from being going around doing different things in Florida, and this is not anything the government is requiring, this is just kind of private choice, but I'll go to these events and we'll be at like a hotel or a restaurant and there'll be packs of people having fun, doing all this. Great, I, I'm all for it. 
And I'd, I've spoken in front of like 1,500 people in a packed ballroom, eating dinner, having drinks, all this stuff. And then they make the servers all wear these masks the whole time. And I'm thinking to myself, what the hell difference is it going to make if you have 1,500 people packed in without masks to make these people wear those masks the whole, it's not comfortable, it's not natural for them to have to do it. And I almost feel like businesses just think like, oh well, if there's one person that gets offended by a server not having a mask on, I don't wanna have to do it. But I'll tell you, your customers will appreciate you treating these people better. And I, the places we've gone where they're able to breathe and they're not having to do it, they're happier, I tell you what, I appreciate it much more. And so we've got to say, you do things based on what actually works and not just theater. Um, but I tell you, I look back, I, you know, because I go in the back way and I talk to the kitchen staff, I talk to these folks, and they're happy to be working for all this. And I'm just thinking to myself, you know, why are you doing that? I go into one of our big um, uh, convenience store chains that's grown a lot here is Wawa. I'm always going in talking to the Wawa folks, and I'm like, when are they going to let you take off the mask? And they're like, well, you know, we're based in Pennsylvania, and this is just it. So, I mean, are we going to have a perpetually mass society? Because COVID will never go to zero. Even the CDC has now acknowledged that. Their policies had been acting like you could eradicate it, but that's not true. It's got animal reserves. It's always going to, it's going to settle into being an endemic virus. And so... Is it, when is the off-ramp on this? And again, this isn't the government saying you gotta do this or that, but I just look at it as a, as a customer, as a consumer, and I wonder, okay, having hundreds of people packed into a bar, then making the bartender only, you know, wear the mask, is that really based in science, or is that just based in theater? So my plea for the workers, for the staff in Florida, they do such a great job, is, you know, let them have some freedom to be able to make these choices in terms of what they're doing. I do think the OSHA rule is gonna go down one way or another. I don't know how quick it'll, I mean, it's stayed right now, but we'll get the, resu oops, we'll get the results of this uh, lottery, I think sometime today. That will tell us whether there's gonna, they may reverse the stay if it's a liberal jurisdiction, if it's uh, one of the conservative circuits, the stay will be in there. And if it is one of the conservative jur uh, uh, jurisdictions, the stays in and it will never take effect. I mean, because the, the US Supreme Court is not, gonna, is not gonna rule to put that back in. I mean, even Justice Roberts would not do that. I mean, this is so far beyond uh, what an agency should be able to do absent congressional authorization. And you know, the federal government's never mandated a vaccine on the general public in the history of the United States of America. When people point to and say, hey, there's a court decision that said you can do mandates, that's always talking about state and local government under their police powers. Federal government doesn't have a police power. So this is a huge, huge expansion of the federal government's oversight ability or regulatory ability. And I can tell you, if they can do this, they're not stopping at this. They will do more um, and they will come at you with more. And this is all being done without a single vote ever taken in the Congress. They go back and find an old statute from decades ago and try to act like that this uh, confers on them the ability to force this uh, right now on folks. And, and so that's just wrong. We're doing a special session of the legislature in Florida to basically say, you know, people should be able to make decisions. They shouldn't be fired based on this. We're protecting all of our uh, police, fire, all those as well as private sector workers. We're giving, making sure parents have the right to make decisions for their kids on these, on these vax, no COVID vax mandates uh, for, for the young kids, um, and then providing some ability for them, you know, to, to enforce that. So we're gonna, I think, be in a much better place than some of these other folks. But if you look at what's happened in Florida, this big migration of people that's come, and, and I see them, and they'll come up to me and they'll say, I had to get out of California. I had to get out of Michigan. I had to get out of these places. I mean, and it's really visceral. And my sense is from talking to people, I mean, we've always had lower taxes than a lot of these states. That's nothing new. And yes, that's, that's uh, drawn people over the years, but it's not something that all of a sudden would cause a deluge of people to come. I think the, what it was was, yes, you can save on taxes, but you have states that had these draconian restrictions and lockdown policies that alienated a lot of people. Honestly, some people couldn't even operate the way they wanted to. Uh, you started to see in a lot of these same places the lockdown states tended to be the states 
where you saw riots and you saw attacks on law enforcement and all these other stuff. Well, gee, a safe community should be something that we all want. You were not seeing safe communities in some of these places. And actually, you have some prosecutors in some cities, they don't even prosecute some of these crimes. You can go in and steal $500 worth of stuff out of a retail store, and they just let you get away with it. They don't even, even charge you, much less prosecute you. Uh, so you started to see that. So, and then the schools being closed, there's a whole confluence of factors that cause people to now look. But I think that having gone through this whole experience, I mean, if we were meeting here in 2019 and I had told you, you know, be prepared to have, you know, schools closed for, and obviously this didn't happen everywhere like Florida, but it did happen some. Schools will be closed for a year. Churches will be shut down. Um, restaurants, you won't be able to go inside of a restaurant, all these other things. If I had told you that, none of you would have believed it. No one said, there's no way that someone could get away with that. And yet you see it, 15 days to slow the spread, and we're still arguing over, I mean, we're not in Florida because we've, you know, we've moved on in terms of that, but, but in the country, they're still arguing over a lot of these different policies and these restrictions. And I think the lesson is, you know, if you give an inch, they will take a mile, and that's what they're doing. You know, Fauci, you know, the minute that COVID's in the rearview mirror, he's not on CNN and NBC all day. And, and he wants to be on that. That's very important to him that he's constantly out there. Uh, and so he's going to drag it on. These other folks have interest in dragging it out longer and longer and longer. Um, and the question is, you know, what's the cost of that? Uh, what's the cost of that in terms of people's freedoms, in terms of their livelihoods, and in terms of their overall happiness? I mean, the thing that I appreciated most with people that came to Florida, both who moved here or just visited here, we're like, man, people are a heck of a lot happier in Florida than they are wherever they came from in some of these other areas, which really got beaten down by that. And that's the thing. I, I wanted to have the, uh, all our businesses doing well, people working and all that. But it's not just an economic impact. If, like, you know, restaurants are shuttered, yes, that's an economic issue. People lose jobs. But it also just weighs down emotionally the community to see, to see shops boarded up like that versus to see something that's vibrant and see society humming, you know, it makes a huge difference in just how you, how you approach life. And so if that just healthiness of whole factors of life is something that I thought has been very, very important. And that's what we've tried to focus on. So we're, um, you know, for those of you who are doing business here, you know, we, we appreciate it. I know it's, um, it's uh, the, the challenges of, yes, you know, free state, but I know there's a lot of need for, for folks. I would say in Florida, we got rid of all the, the additional benefits many, many months ago. Obviously, the, the federal stuff ran out in September. We have 400,000 plus job openings in the state of Florida. Now, in September, there was 194,000 jobs overall created in the U.S. We don't have our October numbers yet state by state, but in September, 194,000 jobs Florida in September alone was 84,500 of those jobs. And so uh, we had more jobs in October. You know, I think Florida will definitely add some, but I think it's probably this thing just takes a little bit of time to kind of work its way through. I don't think it's just gonna snap back where everyone all of a sudden gets back into the workforce. I think it'll be more gradual, and I think it will likely uh, take us into, into next year before we're, at least in Florida, we're back. I think some of these other states, quite frankly, they're gonna have a much tougher time because they're not incentivizing people to go back to work. And so, and you look, you compare like Florida, we're under 5% unemployment. You have some of these other big states are seven, seven and a half percent unemployment. I mean, that's a huge, huge difference and it's almost entirely due to the differences in policies uh, that we see. So I think it'll take a little bit of time uh, to be able to, uh, to work out, but I do think, you know, certainly now, there's never been a better time to look for jobs in, in Florida, I can tell you that, because not only are they available, they're paying more. I mean, people, they're, they're, they're paying, you know, we, got, we, we were worried about, like, you know, some of the minimum wage stuff, whatever, how that would work. I mean, people are happy to pay 15 now to get a lot of the, a lot of the folks. I mean, that's just what's happened. And so if you're willing to work, you're going to have a lot of opportunities to be able to do it. And so, you know, that's a good thing. So we're going to continue to make sure, but our unemployment and everything, the way we approach it is pre-COVID right now. So just like we would have had in on March 1st of 2020, when our unemployment rate was 2.9%, uh, we have right now the same 
basic uh, structure uh, going forward. And again, I just think it's going to take a little bit of time in, in states like Florida. It'll take a longer time in other states um, who are doing it the wrong way um, for that. So we, um, the final thing I'll just say is, you know, we really appreciate uh, what all the hospitality, but, you know, particularly, you know, our hotels and our restaurants and everything really mean to the state of Florida. I know I love visiting people, and when I'm out and about, I'll stop by these family-owned places. How you doing? Most of what I get is we've never done better, uh, which is what I really, um, you know, I'm really happy. Obviously, you know, if you're in the restaurant business and people are flooding into your market, that gives you kind of more fish in the barrel, so that's good. Uh, but I do think the fact that, um, you know, they've been able to operate has been a, been a big, big, big help. So, so we're really uh, happy about that. But we also just, so many great people are in the industry. And these are some, some fantastic people all across the board. And so, uh, you know, I'm just happy that the state's doing well. And I'm happy that I've been able to be able to stand up and be a voice for a lot of those folks. Because they didn't have a lot of people fighting for them, you know, in, in offices like mine. And, and we were one of the ones that did it. And to this day, you know, I will go out, someone will come up to me and thank me for saving their job or saving their business or ca saving their kid for making sure their kid can be in school. Every single time, you know, that happens. And so this really has, has affected a lot of people. Uh, unfortunately, it's affected a lot of people negatively if you did some of the opposite things that we did in Florida. But, but these are really good folks. And so I'm proud of everyone in our state who's a part of this industry. I know other states have a lot of good, good folks too. I will say that I... Um, I, I do appreciate when I get stories of Floridians who are visiting some of these other states. They're at a restaurant. The server asks where you're from. They say Florida, and they say, oh, my gosh, that's the freedom state. I'd love to be able to get there someday. We do like that, and we appreciate that. So, um, so thanks for what you do. Uh, thank you guys for coming. I hope you have an enjoyable experience here. How long are you here? One day. One more day. Okay, one more day from here. So this is actually – so, so – um, Yes, I was born in Jacksonville, but we moved to Dunedin, which is right down the road from here when I was in first grade. And so this is basically where I grew up in Pinellas County, and my parents still live in the same house and everything. So where you're at in Clearwater Beach, this is a place I used to go to as a kid all the time. As I got older, same, same stuff. Um, when I left high school, I never necessarily made it back here. I was in the Navy in Mayport. I did other stuff. Um, but this is a great part of the world, and we're really proud of uh, everything here. And, uh, and certainly for me, I think uh, having been able to travel around the state, the country, and even the world uh, with the military, uh, a great, great place to grow up. So I'm glad you guys picked this place, and uh, I hope you guys come back and, and do it again in Florida uh, next year. So God bless everyone, and thank you. Appreciate it.